Mike Flanagan has established himself as one of the masters of horror on Netflix, and in line with the Halloween season, he released The Midnight Club. With the series already wrapped up, there are just a few questions we need answers to, and in today's video, that's exactly what we'll be talking about. Along with this, we'll also explain the ending of The Midnight Club, and might we also interest you with four spooky miniseries to watch, so keep watching for more. So, without further ado, here's the ending of The Midnight Club explained. The Midnight Night Club, a new Netflix hit about a group of young adults with terminal illnesses living in a hospice, is created by Mike Flanagan. It is based on the same title book by Christopher Pike and with its sincere message and a staggering quantity of jump scares. It is equal parts lovely and terrifying. No one could have predicted the series ending, especially for a mystery and suspense driven show. It is surprising in a typical Flanagan way. And fans are confused. Who's Dr. Stanton, Heather Langenkamp, and who are the ghosts that follow Kevin? Igby Rick and Ilonka Iman Benson around the entire time the performance is on. Here we attempt to tie up the many loose ends of the Midnight Club by providing answers to these and other questions. Starting with Shasta, who is she? In the ninth episode, Shasta admits that she is Julia Jane, but attentive viewers might have realized it before. Shasta undoubtedly knew a lot about Brightcliff for an outsider, including details about Dr. Stanton and where to acquire specific books. Her fascination with herbal treatments and Greek mythology, as well as the tattoos she persuadingly explained away were additional red flags. What happened to Julia during the week she was absent from Brightcliff and returned cured is revealed in the last episode. Cancer patient Julia sought Paragon founder Regina Ballard, Katie Parker, who goes by the name of Assiso, after the Greek goddess of healing, to ask for assistance. She discovered Regina through Athena's diary. Regina's daughter, the one Ilanka finds in the library, we don't speak, Regina tells Julia when she inquires about the whereabouts of Athena, Emma Tremblay, who was detained in episode 5 after Athena phoned the police on her mad mother. There is still no answer to Athena's whereabouts, but not for long. Regina gives Julia's wish. We're not sure how exactly she does it, and the two make up a tale to explain her absence. Shasta is, after all, a member of the original Paragon sect. Moving forward to the next question, who is Dr. Stanton? Despite what Shasta made the audience believe, Dr. Stanton isn't as nefarious as Shasta had suggested. Dr. Stanton conceals her knowledge of the Paragon, although it is clear from her response when Ilanka discovers Athena's diary, which she confiscates and burns. The fact that she is Athena, Regina's estranged daughter, is not immediately apparent. Given that Athena was born in 1924 and the series is set in the 1990s, it begs the question why Dr. Stanton appears to be in her 50s. In the closing moments of The Midnight Club, it is discovered that Dr. Stanton has been hiding an hourglass tattoo on the back of her neck. Underneath the wig, she has been wearing the entire time. Following episode 5, only Athena and her mother have the tattooed symbol. All other members have it on their wrists. The same episode made it clear that Regina wears a wig, just like Dr. Stanton does, indicating that Dr. Stanton may have a genetic problem. Dr. Stanton, in contrast to her mother, rejects Regina's teachings since she has a kind heart. She stands for science, Regina and Shasta for spirituality. While the latter advocates and employs unethical means to combat death, she encourages the teenagers to accept death. Dr. Stanton's conviction ultimately proves to be correct, as Ilanka closes the series, finally prepared to accept her fate due to her efforts. And as awful as that may sound, it's preferable to her killing a lot more people to make a change. Next question, who are the ghosts? Kevin and Ilanka are haunted by the ghosts of an elderly man and woman throughout the entire series. It is unknown why they are the only citizens of Brightcliff that encounter these spirits. This point is not addressed in the conclusion, but at least the identities of the spirits are are disclosed. The program ends with a long shot of a framed newspaper piece from 1898 that shows Stanley Oscar Frellin and Vera Frellin, the house's first occupant. What do you know? They resemble the spirits of Kevin and Alonka identically. Speaking of these ghosts, Rigney, who plays Kevin, told the rap that he believes the key themes with that idea are rebirth and the concept of soulmates or people who are meant to be together. In Pike's book, the elderly ghosts represent prior members of the Midnight Club. And finally, what's the importance of the statue? in the series. The Midnight Club has a rule that every member who leaves must send a sign from the other side. In the climactic episode, Rhett, Daniel Deemer, arrives to pick up a box of Anya's belongings, which includes an ancient ballerina statue whose leg was broken when Anya threw it at Rhett during an altercation. The broken limb is the same leg that Anya ultimately lost to cancer. When Ilanka hands him the package, Rhett observes the statue is mended, almost as if it had never been broken. Ilanka is taken aback and interprets the 
this as a very symbolic sign from Anya. The majority of supernatural occurrences up until this point had rational explanations, so viewers were similarly shocked. Spencer, William Chris Sumter, didn't hear ghosts through the intercom. It was Sandra, and even Kevin and Alanka's ghost sightings are attributed to shared delusions. Shasta wasn't cured by the ritual either. She's sick again. We can only hope that next season will address the critical issues raised by Anya's message from beyond. Now, if you've already finished watching The Midnight Club, here are four other spooky titles you should check out in line with Halloween, starting with Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities. In this anthology of horror stories, the master of grotesquerie, Guillermo del Toro will take on the persona of Ron Sterling as he invites viewers into his museum of curiosities. There are a total of eight episodes, each with a unique plot and director. Two terrifying stories are written by del Toro, one of which is directed by Australian Jennifer Kent. Horror aficionados may recognize Kent from her critically praised debut feature film, The Babadook. Her contribution to Cabinet of Curiosities also stars Essie Davis, a fellow Australian and Babadook actress. Be prepared for some revolting creatures with not one, not two, but three episodes based on H.P. Lovecraft tales and another episode based on Henry Nutter's The Graveyard Rats. Nutter was a member of Lovecraft's literary community and wrote numerous pieces for the Cthulhu mythos. Other submissions include Panos Cosmatos, The Viewing, and Anna Lily Amapur's The Outside, which she directed after A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night. Next is Queer for Fear, the history of queer horror. Look no further than Queer for Fear, a multi-part documentary about how the LGBTQIA community has influenced the horror we know and love. For those who want a little knowledge with their screams, Brian Fuller, who created and wrote the three-year-long television series Hannibal, serves as the show's executive producer. Each episode examines LGBTQIA representation and queer coding in horror throughout history, including gothic literature like Frankenstein, how the lavender fear of the mid-20th century affected horror, and vampire movies from the 1980s that were influenced by the AIDS crisis. And this one is a reboot of a popular 90s classic. Do check out the remake of Interview with a Vampire as well. Remember back in 1994 when Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt were decked out in vampire's teeth and everyone swooned, that but with television. But to adapt Anne Rice's groundbreaking gothic novel into a television series, more than just a switch to a smaller screen has been made. The protagonist of the story, Louis de Point du Lac, was a white plantation owner in the U.S. South during the antebellum period, who gave the titular interview to human reporter Daniel Malloy about love, loss, and the dangers of immortality. Lewis's story is updated in 2022 when it is portrayed by black British actor Jacob Anderson, who made his fortune through a chain of New Orleans brothels. Additionally, the series will focus more on the original novel's homosexual subtext. The portrayal of Lewis as a secretly gay man who is romantically involved with his vampire creator Lestat de Lioncourt is accurate. And finally, we suggest you also try watching The Watcher. The series revolves around a young family that moves into the dream home they have always wanted, 657 Boulevard, only to start getting progressively ominous notes from someone they can only identify as The Watcher. The Watcher claims to be the property's guardian and accuses the couple's kids of compromising the structure of the house. The pair undertake a scary quest to find out who is terrorizing them or to escape out of the house. Whichever comes first, seems a little common? Derek and Maria Broadus truly experienced the events described in 657 Boulevard in 2014, though there is no consolation for fans of a conclusive finale because the real-life watcher was never discovered. And that's everything you need to know about The Midnight Club, as well as our short list of suggestions for Halloween. Do you have any more horror titles you could suggest for the season? Let us know in the comments section below. Thanks for watching today's video, and don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to our channel with the notification bell on for more videos like these. See you next time!